o'clock news starts right now. Just days apart, two separate cases involving a total of 29 migrants found trapped inside train cars. Three people died in both of those cases in total, I should say. Among those found were people from Nicaragua who ended up near Canipa and Eagle Pass. Our Jonathan Cotto speaks with Representative Tony Gonzalez, who says these cases are part of an ongoing years long trend. This has been happening for two years. Honestly, this isn't a new issue for any of us that live along Highway 90. On Friday, two migrants found dead after a total of 17 people were discovered inside a train car east of Canipa. One day later in Eagle Pass, another group of migrants also found inside a rail car, this case resulting in one death. Whether it's Hondo, whether it's Canipa, whether it's Tejenes, Uvalde, Eagle Pass, literally every single week somebody is dying. He says this operation all starts in Eagle Pass, where migrants jump on board the train after crossing into the U.S. illegally, avoiding train inspections that are conducted at the U.S.-Mexico border. I visited a ranch in Eagle Pass maybe about eight months ago, and literally the train comes over, uh, comes over from Mexico. It stops at the train station in the United States, and one mile from that is where all the migrants jump on board. Gonzalez says migrants tend to then jump off in areas like Uvalde, Hondo, and Canipa. Last year in Uvalde, there was a two-year-old girl that jumped off the train, and she lost her, she lost her arm. Uh, her mother also jumped off the train and she lost her foot. And with warmer temperatures, Gonzalez says the death toll will only increase. These cartel members treat these migrants as, as if they're not even people. And says these types of cases, though tragic, take a great toll on border communities and its resources. Imagine pulling bodies out of the train every single week. Uh, you know, imagine that you're having to deal with this stress if you're a firefighter or an EMS or, or a, a sheriff or a police officer. This is what the, the stress is being put on the first responders and it's dangerous. It's the second and third order effects of this border crisis that is hurting uh, really our district. It's hurting America in general, but it's hurting those rural areas the most. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Tonight, three adults and three children killed in the shooting at a private school in Nashville have now been identified. The children are Evelyn Deakhouse, Hallie Scruggs, and William Kenny, all just nine years old. The adults are Cynthia Peak, Mike Hill, and Catherine Koontz, who was the head of that school, all of them in their early 60s. Murders inside yet another school bringing up the pain felt in Uvalde after what happened at Robb Elementary. We spoke with the sister of one of the victims, Jackie Casares. She tells us that she is in disbelief that it's happened yet again. It's just crazy how fresh, how fresh that is. Not even a couple of hours ago that happened that before this, we were literally reading four, five, shooter dead, things like that. It's, I don't know, it's, it's just, the shooting that happened earlier this morning in Nashville after officials say a 28 year old woman got into that school through a side entrance. Metro Nashville police say the shooter was carrying two assault style rifles and a handgun. She was killed by officers. The neighbors worried after a fifth reported shooting at one home since early February. The latest one happening this morning around 730 at a home in the 3100 block of West Gerald Avenue. It's on the south side. Evidence markers in the street showed more than half a dozen bullets fired. Police said there was no damage to the home. A woman who didn't want to go on camera tells us gunshots are a regular occurrence. No one injured in the shooting. Police say they have conflicting information about the shooter's getaway car. A man was stabbed during a fight on the city's south side overnight. This happened sometime around 930 last night in the 700 block of West Mallee Boulevard. Officers say two men got into some kind of fight when one of them stabbed the other and ran off. That victim was taken to Bamsey. SAPD did not say what the fight was about, but police have said that suspect is still on the run. He's behind bars after allegedly setting a woman's car on fire because she wouldn't let him spend the night. That's according to an arrest affidavit. 38 year old Jose Espinoza arrested yesterday after police say he used lighter fluid and matches to set a woman's car on fire. The victim says Espinoza was upset because she wouldn't let him spend the night at her apartment. SAPD says Espinoza admitted to setting the car on fire. He also told them he was upset because he gave her gas money and she refused to give him a ride. He's now being held in the Bear County Jail charged with arson. 
The case of a murder and robbery of a man outside of a wing stop is going to trial this week. This happened back in 2019, and one of the two suspects arrested, Jimmy Tran, is facing a capital murder charge. Erica Hernandez gives us a look back at this case and tells us what we can expect in the trial that begins tomorrow. On August 12, 2019, Andres Salinas was gunned down behind the wing stop in the 13,900 block of Nacogdoches. At the time of the shooting, no arrests were made, but a witness came forward and told police what they saw. According to the affidavit, the witness told police Salinas walked up to a car and then ran away when two individuals got out and started shooting at Salinas until he collapsed to the ground. The two men then fled the scene. Investigators were able to get surveillance video from a nearby HEB and identify the suspect's car as a white Hyundai. The person the car was tied to was Sebastian Espinar. When he came in for questioning, the affidavit says that he admitted to the shooting and told police he and Jimmy Tran were buying drugs from Salinas, but then decided they wanted to rob him instead. Espinar says that once he showed Salinas he had a gun, Salinas reached in and grabbed some cash and took off running. And that is when both he and Tran got out and started shooting at him. Espinar was arrested and charged, and Tran was eventually found and charged a few weeks later. Espinar has since taken a plea deal in this case, but has yet to be sentenced. That is because he could be taking the stand this week against Jimmy Tran. Tran did not take a plea deal in this case, and since he is charged with capital murder, if found guilty, he would automatically be given life in prison without parole, as the death penalty was not considered. Opening statements are scheduled to begin tomorrow morning in the 186th District Court. Erica Hernandez, case at 12 News. Happening tonight, as a matter of fact, happening shortly, the Harlandale ISD School Board expected to vote on possibly closing at least five elementary schools in the district. The consolidation, as they put it, would happen due to years of financial issues and a decline in student enrollment. Board members will vote on three potential options. The first, consolidating the five schools. Second, keeping the schools open. And third, laying off staff. That meeting will begin at 6.15 tonight at the STEM Early College High School. We'll bring you the latest updates throughout the snoozecast and, of course, on KSAT.com. We are less than a month away from the start of early voting for the May elections. Things like city council seats and the mayor's seat will be on the ballot, plus several local bond elections. Right now on KSAT.com, you can find a sample ballot to look over. Just scan this QR code. You can find it and our election coverage so far by scanning what you see here, going to KSAT.com. Check out traffic right now. Let's go to I-10 and ProBant, and you can see... Traffic moving very smoothly in both directions. And as you start off your week, there's some closures you're going to want to be aware of. Stephen Cavazos has what you need to know as you plan your commute. The road work continues in and around the Alamo City, so know before you go. Let's talk about what's happening here along US 90 on the west side of San Antonio. Road repairs. All right, so this starts Monday, March 27th, and that will take us up to the end of the month. That's Friday, March 31st. This does start at a busy time, guys, 9 in the morning and should wrap at 3 in the afternoon. So what we'll see out there is a single eastbound main uh, lane closure, that is from FM 471 to Metzler Lane. All right, taking a jump here to I-10 on the east side of Bear County. We have have road repairs that is uh, ongoing. This will take us up to Tuesday, March 28th. It is overnight, so late night owls, early bird commuters, no before you go, 9 in the evening to 5 in the morning. Full closure of the eastbound main lanes from Graytown Road to File Road. All right, guys, one more for you here. I-10 in Kendall County. We have painting work, and that is uh, begins on Wednesday, March 29th, and that will take us to Thursday, March 30th. Again, this starts at a busy time. 9 in the morning should wrap at 3 in the afternoon. Single lane closures in both directions from Scenic Loop road to state highway 46 but there is plenty more closures happening right now scan that qr code and it will take you directly to our ksat traffic page we have a full list of all the current closures so plan your commute ahead of time all right let's take a look outside with live cam right now this is a pretty great picture from this view this week adam it sounds like we've got some wind to talk about yeah, we do have some wind that's going to be picking up tonight, and you'll really feel it, especially first thing tomorrow. Some gusts up to 40 miles per hour, and we have some thunderstorms causing a bit of wind. Nothing severe out there at the moment. You get just west of Junction along I-10 between Junction and Sonora. Heavy downpours there along I-10 up in the hill country. 
Lightning, of course, and thunder, maybe even a small pocket of hail associated with that currently south of I-10. And then just west of Del Rio and west of Eagle Pass, just in Mexico here, some thunderstorms that are reaching about 45,000 feet tall. So definitely visible from Del Rio and Eagle Pass. It's only actually 24 miles uh, southwest of Del Rio. And we are expecting some more development as we go through the night and even on into the day tomorrow. As for this evening, 20% chance of a few stray storms developing. Temperatures falling down through the 70s and that north wind picking up. We're going to talk more about that, what it means for our temperature swings in just a bit. All right, thanks, Adam. Have you heard of ChatGPT or even used it yet? It's a form of artificial intelligence that can create text, think full articles, full essays, really just about anything in seconds. Watch it work here. I asked ChatGPT to write today's KSAT Explained script for me, and the program did it in less than a minute. But as cool as it is, it's also concerning. There's huge dangers. First off, we need guardrails because if we come to a place where we trust AI, we know how those movies end, and it's not good. Today in a new case, that explains we look at how ChatGPT works and some of the big ethical questions that come along with this new technology, especially in the world of education. Case that explains is coming up at 6:30, and for the record, the story you'll hear then—that's the one that I wrote. Okay, good to know. Yeah. From the Eiffel Tower to an awful trip, certainly wasn't ideal. Still head on the news at six, a nightmare vacation for a San Antonio couple. How they escaped political turmoil going on right now in France. I want to give you a quick look at what we're working on on the night beat. Hostile and toxic. That's how some resigning employees are describing the work environment in the office of Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez. Our KSAT investigates team did some digging and reviewed more than 100 resignation letters and exit interviews of that office. What some of them had to say tonight. It changes coming for those who depend on Medicaid. Some people could soon lose those benefits. What you need to do to make sure you're covered. Those stories and more on the night beat at 10. It was not the dream vacation a San Antonio couple planned or budgeted for. Their bucket list trip was a cruise through France, but political unrest in that country upended those plans last week. Yeah, they showed Courtney Friedman how strikes and protests stalled the French economy all around them and how they finally made it home to San Antonio. France has always been on the travel bucket list for Oscar and Sherry Carrero. Supposed to be a simple cruise from... Um, Avignon, France, all the way up through Lyon, with several stops at several small cities in France. But two days into the trip, French President Emmanuel Macron forced legislation affecting the workforce, including pushing the retirement age from 62 to 64. Protests and strikes began immediately. The lockmasters are on strike along the river. We were just stuck at Avignon and never hit any of the other ports of call. It wasn't just cruise ships. Oscar's video shows barges and container ships docked along the shoreline. People are expecting things to be delivered on time, such as food, such as medicine. Supply issues plus strikes on public transportation kept workers from showing up to shops, restaurants and hotels. So while the couple didn't run into the volatile riots in Paris, it was hard to find food and accommodations. In several cities, Oscar captured trash piled in the streets as sanitation workers striked, striking anything that would make the government money. Because of them, we don't pay. Going through one of the toll booths and we had toll attendants with pirate flags out and cheering. What was the thing you were most worried about? Believe it or not, we were most worried about getting home. Luckily, they were able to get to the airport on time, but not without a warning from the airline that their connecting flight to Germany could be delayed because of an unrelated German airline strike there. Needless to say, they were grateful to touch down in San Antonio yesterday. And how was last night finally being home? Oh, it was glorious. They'll continue to watch the fallout in France, but this time from afar. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Back here at home, let's take a look outside with Sky 12, looking at the land bridge there at Hardburger Park. That is such a cool thing to walk over. Have you gone yeah. to check that oh, out? Oh, yeah, and you see yeah. a bunch of people actually walking those trails right now, and it is a gem.
Yeah, not a bad day to be out there. Maybe not the prettiest day, but the wind might be catching your attention if you're out and about later this week, Adam. Yeah, especially uh, late tonight and all day tomorrow. You're going to notice the wind, and that's going to blow in some cooler air because it's going to be coming out of the north. We're talking a high tomorrow of 70. Today we hit 80, tomorrow 70. By Wednesday, a high of only 65. So clearly a temperature drop followed by our typical rise up again Thursday and Friday. And by Friday, actually, we'll be in the lower 80s. So a bit of a roller coaster ride on the way. The low point will be on Wednesday. All right, let's take a look at the big picture. We talked about some of those showers and thunderstorms developing off parts of the hill country and just west of the Rio Grande. And there's some more activity stretching northward in central Texas, but not a whole lot of coverage out there at the moment. You look closely and it's Kimball and Sutton counties and then just west of Del Rio by about 25 miles. Here's our future cast and it indicates the development of more showers and thunderstorms through the night and even the morning tomorrow and really off and on throughout the entire day tomorrow. 9 a.m. It's shown most of the action just west of San Antonio and then some more development closer to San Antonio as we get into the midday and afternoon hours and don't pay such close attention to the exact placement and location of these showers and storms because it's not very often that it verifies for the exact spot. But somewhere in our area, we are expecting some of these pop up showers and storms to develop off and on during the day tomorrow. It's not going to be a big drought denter, but we'll take what we can get. We're thinking about 30% coverage through the day tomorrow, then dropping down to 20% every day all the way through Friday. So we do have daily rain chances. Unfortunately, they're just not all that significant and uh, we're not expecting anything widespread. No good soaking rain that would benefit a lot of us all at once. All right, that's it for rain chances. Let's talk about the changing dew points and wind. 78 degree air temperature right now. Dew point of 61. Bit of humidity in the air right now. That's going to change with our wind. The wind is already starting to shift around, and as it shifts really from the north overnight tonight, by 2 a.m., we're gusting up to 30 miles per hour. First thing in the morning tomorrow, we're talking wind gusts between 30 and 40 miles per hour. So very gusty and a breezy day tomorrow. You'll notice that wind out of the north, and I do think we'll have peak wind gusts across our area very briefly and periodically up to about 45 miles per hour in some of the more exposed locations. And then after sunset tomorrow, that wind starts to pump the brakes. I mentioned dew points, low 60s locally right now. So we feel the humidity. It's just it's not at the oppressive levels and some drier air to the north. That drier air gets pushed in with that gusty wind and you'll notice the change. Dew points drop off in the lower 40s tomorrow, so a lack of that muggy feeling in the air still will be able to generate some showers and storms. You're just not going to feel the mugginess in the air and you won't again until Thursday we'll of a few muggy days and then phew, the dew points fall off again for Saturday very briefly. So tomorrow we start the day at 60 at 7 a.m. By noon we're at 67, a high temperature of 70. Those gusts up to 40 miles per hour. Fairly gray day tomorrow. We could see a few breaks in the clouds, but I don't think it's all that likely. Bernie, a high of 67, Pleasanton and Poteet making it up to 72 for the high temperature. And then we rebound back into the low 80s by Friday and the upcoming weekend. And by the way, I want to point out with this temperature roller coaster, maybe some long sleeves at the bus stop for the kids Wednesday morning at 52. All right, good point. Thanks, Adam. All right, Jerry Jones has some thoughts on Zeke. Yes, you Larry. can never say never mm. when it comes to Jerry Jones True. making decisions, right? So Jerry is out at the NFL owners meetings and he left the door open for Zeke possibly returning. And it was a good weekend for Brahma's kicker, John Parker Romo, coming up. Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones said he hasn't closed the door on running back Ezekiel Elliott. Speaking with reporters at the NFL owners meetings, Jerry said they never offered Zeke a contract adjustment before releasing him for salary cap reasons, but he has not closed the door on him returning 
if he doesn't sign with another team. It was recently reported that Zeke had narrowed down his potential landing spots to three teams, and that list includes the Eagles, Bengals, and the Jets. The NFL owners' meetings are being held at the Biltmore Luxury Resort in Phoenix, Arizona. Houston Texans head coach D'Amico Ryan is there to represent his team. During his Q&A with the press, he was asked what does he expect to get from former Cowboys tight end Dalton Schultz after they signed him to a one-year deal. I think Dalton has, has shown that he can make some plays you know, in the passing game, in the vertical passing game. So I'm excited to add him. I think he's you know, a tight end. is very quarterback friendly position, right? Easy completions. All right, Dalton has done a, a really good job of expanding his game, being becoming a better blocker as well. So I think all around we got a, a quality starting tight end in Dalton. Ryan's also confirmed that the Texans will bring in both Ohio State quarterback C.J. Stroud and Alabama QB Bryce Young for a visit at NRG Stadium. Houston currently holds the second overall pick in the upcoming draft. In the XFL, the San Antonio Brahmas won 15-9 at the Arlington Renegades to keep their playoff hopes alive. The Brahmas' offense did not find the end zone, but linebacker Jordan Williams did, scoring San Antonio's only touchdown, returning a fumble 39 yards in the second quarter. And kicker John Parker Romo added a pair of fourth-quarter field goals to seal the deal. And Coach Ward wasn't surprised his kicker had a great day. Our kicker, John, had a, a, a baby reveal party yesterday. He's having a little girl, so I knew he was hes living at an all-time high, man. So uh, he rose to the occasion, knocked down some key field goals for us. The 2-4 and four Brahmas will play at the 1-5 and five Vegas Vipers Saturday at 2 p.m. After dropping all four games on their road trip, the Spurs are back home in San Antonio, getting ready to host the Utah Jazz Wednesday night. With seven games left in the regular season, the Spurs need two more wins to avoid their worst record in franchise history, set in the 1996-97 season when they went 20-62. and On top of that, Wednesday is the Spurs' last true home game this season, and it could also be Pop's last home game at the AT&T Center. After falling to Boston, Zach Collins was asked if he has any idea on what Pop plans to do. I can't speak for what he's going to do. You know, I can't really, I can't really guess you know, where he's at. But uh, you know, for me personally, I hope it's not his last game. And I think everybody that's ever been a Spurs fan or been a part of this organization would probably agree with me. You know, we don't want that to be his last game. We all love, we all love playing for him. I personally love playing for him. I've, I've grown a lot just in the couple years that I've learned from him. So, uh, me personally, I, selfishly, I hope it's not. But uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see. Pop and the Spurs will host the Jazz Wednesday night at seven. I did want the game ball, so I chucked it to my dad. I hope the NCAA, I hope they got out of the arena in time so the NCAA can chase them down, but I told him to run. I'll get it later at the hotel. I hope Caitlin Clark's dad gets to keep her historic basketball. The Iowa guard helped the Hawkeyes beat Louisville 97-83 to advance to the Final Four. Clark had 41 points, 10 rebounds, and 12 assists to become the first player in NCAA tournament history, men's or women's, to record a 40-point triple Double. Wow. Yes. Wow. They yeah. should let her keep that game. <laughs> yeah. That. Absolutely. Yeah. NCAA hands off. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Thank you. Still to come here, what is chat GPT? How it works and some of the big ethical questions that come with this new artificial intelligence. We explain in a new case that explains next. It is called Chat GPT. It's the latest tech innovation blowing people's minds, whether you're into tech or not. It's worth paying attention to because it has the potential to revolutionize just about everything. It's a tool that writes texts. Think full articles, full essays, even more in just seconds. And it's all based off of just a few words that the user puts into it. So it makes writing easy and fast, but it's not perfect. Here's Case that explains. ChatGPT is a large language model and a form of generative AI or artificial intelligence. <laughs> Did we lose you already? Let's try this. When someone says ChatGPT, what comes to mind for you? I get really excited and I start to speak faster. Ryan McPherson is a communications professor at UTSA. I am using it almost every day. And he is enthusiastic about ChatGPT. 
It is one of the most revolutionary technologies that is going to impact everything we do in society. ChatGPT produces text based on a question that it's asked or a prompt that it's given. Sometimes we struggle to explain things to other people, and this can give us a way to explain it at different levels. So I can say, explain ChatGPT or any other subject like I'm a fifth grader, and it can give me a simple bulleted list that I can more easily understand than going to Wikipedia and searching or going to Google and searching. Or it can write full articles or essays, paragraph after paragraph in seconds. For McPherson, I put in my integrated marketing communication assignment, I gave it the recipe, and it's really good at following recipes. And so it produced a project that was junior to senior level. And I was like, wow, this is gonna change everything. Watch this, I asked ChatGPT to write this story for me. All that content in less than a minute. It not only just accelerates your work, but it gives you more of an op it, it gives you more time to be the editor and the curator of your work. Grace Delgado is a digital marketer who uses the program to help make blogs, ads, and other content. Instead of focusing on that first paragraph, that second paragraph, and your conclusion, it just gets it started for you so you can add the best to it. That is your twist. The ability to create something this thorough, this fast, is new. But the technology to predict language is not. It's actually been out there for a long, long time. Um, it's just getting better over time. My name is Anthony Rios. I'm an assistant professor in information systems and cybersecurity. Language model is basically you're given some input sequence of tokens, and then you're trying to predict future tokens. You can think of a token as basically a word, but sometimes we're thinking about subwords. As an example, um, you know, given the input sequence, the University of Texas at. Right? And then the model would learn to predict things like San Antonio, or Austin, or Dallas. Something I was thinking of is a feature on my email. Autocomplete, right? If I type the word sounds, my email suggests good explanation for it every time. Is that the same kind of thing? It's the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. Um, you know, and, and autocomplete has been around forever, right? You imagine Google, right? Typing out like some things on a Google search and you're seeing new things come up. But this is far more and more complex than a few words. The company OpenAI debuted ChatGPT in November 2022. At that time, the large language model was trained how to predict text based on, well, a lot of stuff online that had been published up until its debut. Then it was updated mid-March. And with every update, ChatGPT incorporates more current content. You can ask it to come up with anything, really. All you have to do is create an account and you can try it for free. And with every use, this technology is evolving as it learns from us. Like if an output comes from the system, like you're playing with ChatGPT and you say, hey, no, this is not good, or this is good, like a thumbs up or a thumbs down, then it can learn it over time. Um, but um, humans are actually providing that feedback. So how in the world can humans provide that feedback, provide those kind of guidelines for basically everything on the internet. Yeah, they can't, they can't. It's impossible to, to cover everything. So chat GPT is not the answer to every question. No, 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 definitely not. Though some people think it is. The use of chat GPT is certainly raising questions, especially when it comes to ethics. There's huge dangers. First off, we need guardrails because if we come to a place where we trust AI, we know how those movies end and it's not good. The world of academia may be the first to wrestle with the pros and cons of this technology. I think a lot of people immediately assume that it's going to be used for nefarious ends, that students are going to use it to cheat and to plagiarize. I think that potential exists, but I don't think it's inevitable. The internet has already provided plenty of ways to cheat. A big challenge for the professors we talked to is how to incorporate ChatGPT and get students to use it responsibly while making sure they're still learning something. It's the subject of professor workshops at Trinity University. Students are trying to get from point A to point B, whether that's you know a credential or a grade or even just an experience that they hope to have in the class. And we try to put the learning in between point A and point B. And this is almost like there's a way around the entire 
apparatus that we've created that's supposed to teach them something. But ChatGPT is not just about creating something easily and quickly. There could be an upside in education and beyond. A lot of people come from backgrounds where, say, they learned English as a second language. Or maybe, you know, they don't have a very strong, you know, writing history or the educational background, or they just haven't practiced writing very often, right? So this actually is a very good tool to help create professional writing samples. What if I showed my students all the things that this technology is doing well? Like it's organizing an essay really nicely. It's got great grammar. It's, it's supporting its claims with evidence. It can take the place of critical thinking for our students. So in education, we're looking for ways to integrate it into our courses and into our assessment practices with a bias towards making sure that students are still able to think critically and be prepared for the job market. Because like it or not, this tech exists in that job market. We can't ignore the technologies that students will have access to in those lives outside of school. Is using Google cheating, is using books cheating, or using reference guides cheating. At the end of the day, AI is a tool. ChatGPT isn't the only generative AI. It's gotten the biggest buzz, but other models are already out there. So whether for educational, professional, or just personal use, there are some words of caution. ChatGPT makes mistakes. Here's just one example. The bot saying that 13 is not a prime number because it's divisible by three. 13 is a prime number, and it was correctly defining what a prime is and what divisible means. So Somebody might not realize it's false because it sounds so confident. You know, it doesn't say, this may be, it doesn't use modal verbs. I think, or I may, it'll say, this is it, right? And if people don't take that into consideration, there's these unintentional harms as well. New technology always signals innovation. It's up to the user to let it spark and not stifle their own. One of the big dangers here is creativity and innovation. Because if we're all following the recipe and we're all looking for answers in the back of the book, then where is our innovation, where is our creativity, and how do we drive conversations forward in meaningful ways? Interesting, huh? Yes. A, a few questions there. You can watch any case that explains story on demand by scanning this QR code. You can also find explains anytime on the case YouTube channel. We'll be right back.